It's uh, very nice to be here at APN6. I uh, was very surprised uh, early this week to find out that I'm a member of a very rare binary system. The only two people have been to every APN meeting. Um, I was not surprised that my binary companion was known. I'm going to talk about our course um, just to try and give you a little update on where we stand with our understanding of the evolution of these stars. As you probably know, Arco is one of the first uh, variable stars ever discovered. Uh, this is the discovery paper from 1797 in the uh, uh, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. We can have to say it's available on ABS if you want to look it up. Um, it's a very nice little paper by this guy, Edward Piggott, who uh, observed from his backyard in Bath, England with a pair of opera glasses. But he's got a, a nice table of observations. And uh, here he says, not visible with an excellent night glass, therefore less than the length magnitude, a remarkably rapid disappearance. And so uh, he did, discovered the uh, behavior of our four stars. And uh, this is the light curve of our four itself. It's, the, it's about six magnitude at maximum. And uh, this is from 2002 to the present. Our core has been in an extremely deep and extended decline. These declines are caused by uh, clouds of dust forming along the line of sight to the star. So, if you've been to any of my talks the last uh, five years, you'll know that there's uh, two scenarios that have been suggested for. Uh, the formation of these stars. And they've been around for a long time, uh, since the late 70s, early 80s. Some papers by Webbing and even in Tudukov, uh, suggesting uh, that they're possibly formed by the merger of a helium white dwarf and a CO white dwarf, or uh, through a final helium shell flash of a star that's just about to become a white dwarf. And um, of course, if it's a final flash, then the star may have been uh, planetary in the past. So we have a bunch of uh, pieces of evidence which are somewhat contradictory, um, although lately been tending towards the white dwarf merger, um, particularly because of the discovery a few years ago of a huge overabundance of uh, oxygen 18 and uh, fluorine also in these stars. And when I say overabundance, I mean you know, in the sun, the ratio of oxygen 16 to oxygen 18 is about 500. In some of these arc war stars, the ratio is 1. Um, this is very, very unusual, and it's hard to understand how we could get this high of oxygen 18 on the surface of the star. So I thought I'd show at least one planet here. This is uh, ABL 58, and at the center of this is a little blob which is material that was uh, expelled from this star when it uh, possibly had a final thing that shell flash uh, back in uh, 1919. Uh, it's a V605 Aquila. Um, there's been two of these objects that we've observed uh, since we've had um, modern telescopes. And one is V605 Aquila in uh, the early 1900s, the other is a object in uh, the 1990s. And both of these stars were sort of nova-like in their light curves. They got very bright very fast, and then sort of went up and down a few times, and then dis basically disappeared uh, because large amounts of dust were forming around the stars. Um, there's actually a spectrum that was taken of B605 Aquila in uh, 1921, and that's it on the top here. And this is the sort of typical arc of war star, and then on the bottom here is uh, spectrum of saccharides option. You can see that there's um, some definite similarities. So it's, at this time in 1921, um, B605 was about 5,000 degrees effective temperature, and you can see saccharides object very similar. Lots of carbon was the swan mass. Um, we did manage to get a spectrum of B605 Aquila with BLT in uh, 2001. It's still about 21st magnitude today, still behind a lot of dust. And um, most of these are lines from the PN, surrounding PN. There's a few 
stellar lines here, like carbon 4, 58, 06. And so um, the indication today is that uh, V6 block of cooling, which was 5,000 degrees in 1921, is about 95,000 degrees today. And so in this very short period of time, it's gone all the way back across the HR diagram. Um, this is what the blocks do. We've been following with uh, Hubble Space Telescope for many years. And um, here's uh, the option in three and this connection two. And this is the blob which is expanding away um, from the star, and um, which is hydrogen efficient. And very, very strangely, as uh, a little bit by Weston and also by Lau showed, uh, that uh, it's something like 34% neon by mass. Um, so it's not even clear that this is a final flash object. Um, it may, in fact, have been in the book. Here's uh, just some examples of the circumstellar material we see around uh, our course. Of course, this is the famous Eskimo Nebula. This is a picture of ABL 78. That was shown earlier in this meeting. And um, here's two Arco War stars, UWSN and Arco War itself. And uh, these are both HST images as well. And you can see the similarities in the morphology of all of these guys with these nice cometary features uh, pointing away from the star. Um, and so at least in a very simplistic sense, these uh, shells that are, are existing around the Arco War, and these are uh, now, neutral shells, of course, today. The, so we're just seeing them uh, and in reflected light from dust around uh, the stars. But um, it's conceivable that these are fossil uh, planetary shells. Arcobor itself has a huge uh, shell around it. It's been known since the IRAS days. Uh, this is the IRAS 100. Here's the uh, Spitzer MIPS images. And then we have some uh, Herschel Spire <coughs> images as well. And um, the Arcobor shell is, it, dust is visible out to 500 microns. And this, uh, the shell is about something like 20 arc minutes in, in diameter. Uh, this is just the SCD of Arcobor. Um, here's the star, of course, and, and the dust. And so it's the recent data with uh, MIPS and, and Spire show that it's got quite a bit of cold dust around it, and which our models show is about 10 to minus 2 small masses of dust. And if you, again, we don't know what the dust to gas ratio is in this star, but if it's something like 100, then we have an amazing two uh, solar masses of dust in the shell around our core, which is not, uh, which is uh, fit in with, uh, if it were a mass of uh, planetary, it could have a shell. Uh, I mentioned the option 18. We've been continuing. This is the original spectrum of HD 137613, where we discovered the option 18 in the CO bands and the, in the K band. And you can see that all of the CO bands are doubled here, uh, where we see the C12 option 16 and C12 option 18 bands. And so in this star, uh, the ratio is about 0.5. This is a star we just observed with IRTF this year, uh, one of the new ARC reports that we discovered, and it similarly has extremely strong uh, auction 18 features and a lot of auction 18 surface to the star. We also see in the, the warmer stars like our core itself and UW Sand, which are about 7,000 degrees, don't show any molecular bands, so we can't observe the CO, but we can see fluorine in the spectrum of these stars. And um, if you have a lot of oxygen, they have a similar overabundance of fluorine. So it looks like all of the Arc of War stars have, uh, probably have oxygen 18. One of the weird things is that uh, a fair number, maybe five or six of the Arc of Wars, show lithium in their uh, spectra, and, uh, and that includes Arc of War itself. And uh, here, of course, there's a, 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 a spectrum of Sakharov's object, which uh, before it sort of disappeared behind the dust, uh, the spectra were taken out for a couple of years, and it showed that actually the carbon-13 lines, or sorry, the lithium lines were increasing in, uh, in strength. And so um, it's hard to understand 
how we can have lithium and oxygen 18 on the surface of the same star. And uh, but that's actually what we have now. Uh, a couple of stars, mm -hmm. uh, like our core itself, have both an overabundance of fluorine and uh, lithium in the spectrum. So anyone who can think of a way of making oxygen 18 without destroying lithium, I'd like to talk to them about. Um, I always give these talks and say that our core stars have no detectable carbon-13. Uh, this is now not true. Um, two or three of them, including uh, BCRA here, have, uh, have detectable carbon-13 in their spectrum in their atmospheres. And of course, uh, one of the main differences has been between the final flash objects and the arc core is that the final flash seem to have lots of uh, carbon-13 now a subset of our cores that do have it. One of the things we've been doing the last few years is uh, trying to discover more our core stars. The, they're very, very rare. When I started working on these guys uh, about 25 years ago, there were only about 30 known in the galaxy, and we were discovering maybe one a year. Um, but we've been looking uh, through a lot of databases that are now available. This is the ASAS-3. Uh, data, so we just looked at lots and lots of uh, light curves and then verified with uh, spectra, and so we discovered a bunch of new Marco War stars that way. And uh, along with my uh, collaborator, Patrick Tisserand, uh, we've been discovering new Marco War stars by trying to identify them through uh, infrared colors, uh, particularly now that we have the WISE data. And so this has been pretty successful, so now we have about 100 known. Uh, our core stars in the galaxy. And so this is where they are. Um, and uh, just to give you so they're very, very concentrated in the bulge uh, in our galaxy. And I just put it here for comparison of the distribution of planet pairs. Um, so this is sort of where we are today. Um, that it's still uh, a bit of a mystery. The oxygen eight, presence of oxygen 18 uh, seems to point very strongly towards the white or merger scenario uh, because during the merger you can get uh, very hot conditions where nucleosynthesis can take place. You can get some partial helium burning, which and the material of this partial burning could end up on the surface of the new star. Um, and uh, but why you would end up with some lithium left out on the surface? I don't know. Similarly, if you're making oxygen 18 and fluorine, you should be destroying uh, the carbon 13. Um, the other evidence that I haven't talked about, of course, is that uh, none of the arc cores are known to be binaries. Now, if they're the product of a merger, then they all used to be binaries, so it makes perfect sense. Um, and uh, again, a few of the arc cores, like arc core itself, have uh, shells around them. Uh, that at least uh, morphologically look similar to planetary shells. Um, and, and again, it's just a small number of stars that have like the uh, carbon 13, the lithium, and the fossil shells. And so it's conceivable there's two channels for making an arc core star or something that looks like an arc core star. The other two things that are, that are very important here are the lifetimes. You saw that the B605 Aquilae lasts a very, very short time in its sarcomore phase. It looks like Sakurai's object is, is also having, having, having a similarly rapid evolution. And so they don't seem to stay in the archivore phase for more than a few years. We know that archivore itself has been in archivore for at least 200 years. The other thing is there's some, we have some evidence uh, through models of the pulsations of these stars or the masses. Um, and we, they seem to be in the area of 0 0.8, 0 0.9 solar masses which is, um, uh, makes sense if they were the merger of two white dwarfs. Um, and so that's a very strong piece of evidence that um, towards the white dwarf merger. Um, anyway, I'm hoping by APN7 that I'll be able to uh, make a choice between merger and, and final flash. You know, so we'll wait and see. Thanks a lot. Thanks, I can see two questions at the back. Lisa first.
So, uh, this is very interesting. Uh, from the uh, statistical numbers of our versus, for example, like the standard population in the galaxy, uh, how many do you expect? How many final initial flash do you expect? How many white people to generate the uh, measures to expect that the effect can be coincide with the number of white people? Because it's very interesting. So there's now some arc of war stars between 20 and 30 of them known in the LMC, and so if we, and that is uh, should be a much better census of the total number of stars in, in a galaxy. So if you just sort of extrapolate from the LMC to the galaxy, there should be uh, two or three thousand arc of wars, um, and if they last, uh, again we don't know, but if they last in the fourth to the fifth years, then it more or less fits in with the the birth rate of uh, merger of white dwarf mergers of the Canadian seal white dwarfs. Peter Tatema. This is another topic uh, concerning the mass. If you estimate the uh, mass, dust mass, then you should keep in mind the changing optical properties of dust source, dust size. You can get extremely different estimation of Last month, I saw a beautiful talk a month ago by student of Mike Barrow showing this effect on the case of estimation of dust mass in supernova. I completely agree. Uh, this uh, result is very well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you comment how, uh, what's the mechanism how this is our own dust so quickly so that there is a sharp dip? Uh, uh, curves. It's very interesting. The, the evidence, the empirical evidence, is that the dust is actually forming very close to the atmospheres of these stars. There's several of these stars where the phase of their pulsations is correlated with the onset of the dust formation, which indicates that it's happening in the same spot. Uh, these stars are mainly 5,000 to 7,000 degrees, so it's, it's pretty warm uh, for dust dust. If it's amorphous carbon dust, which it is then should condense at about 1500 degrees. Um, but these things are pulsating, so I think it's a very uh, uh, nonlinear sort of thing where the during the pulsation you get uh, density enhancement where the dust or the sort of gas is a little bit cooler, cooler and you get CO forming. CO can cool itself very efficiently, and so uh, you get uh, dust forming. And once the dust forms, uh, it shields itself very efficiently, so it can't survive. And it, I, I didn't have time to show in this talk, but we have evidence that, that the, the dust is then just blowing away from the star by radiation pressure. So that light curve I showed at the beginning, with our core has been down continuously for six years, means that it's making dust over and over again um, in order to maintain the, the optical depth that we're seeing. The graphite, I thought, in high depth. Um, go on. Two, two comments. First, uh, it's true that the two of us have been to the all APN, but there are also people who have been to the first one, who meets in the middle, and Kat Katrina here, and, and I teach them. The second, those who know me, know me, you know that I never take a small star to one direction, I'm always in the middle somewhere. So uh, I would uh, combine these two, and uh, as, as you know, I think we, are, we have good, actually, perfect evidence for merger at the end of a common emperor. So then you get the mass of 0 0.2, 0 0.9, po uh, probably with a helium white dwarf colliding with the core. And what you say, if you burn oxygen or fourth fluorine, and then you need to destroy lithium, probably it's spherical symmetry. If you have no spherical symmetry, you are part of the envelope of massive core. You have burning the other part, no. And then you can explain aqua bore, having big aqua bore, which is a nebula mountain coming from the injection of the common envelope. So I, I think Melcher at the end of the common envelope can, might be working. Okay. We, need, we need to work it out, so maybe you should do another possibility. That you could yes. Okay. We'll work on it. Okay, I think it's time for, uh, for coffee. Thanks to all the speakers again. Thanks for coffee.